Episode 36, The Paradox. Welcome to The Paradox with your attending, Dr. Eric Larson. He is a practicing anesthesiologist and clinical assistant professor at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. Listen in as he takes you behind the scenes of what practicing medicine in today's ever-changing world is like with another doctor. The Paradox is a fun and accidentally informative show for physicians, patients, or anyone who has ever found themselves in a waiting room. Welcome to The Paradox. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Larson. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of The Paradox. And today we're going to be talking about markets and medical students. My guest today is Dr. Beth Haynes, who's the medical director for the Benjamin Rush Institute. The organization is focused on medical students' education. It's run primarily through medical students, and it's equivalent, as she says, to something like the Federal Society in other law schools throughout the country. It's a way of introducing medical students to a different way of looking at the healthcare system. Instead of having a top-down command and control sort of system as we do now, with the third, dominant third-party payer system, government payers like Medicare and Medicaid, it's a way of looking at solutions to medicine that are outside what we traditionally think of as ways of delivering care. Things we've talked about a lot in the show, whether that's direct primary care, freestanding emergency rooms, freestanding operating rooms, whatever. Whether you're a medical student, a resident, an attending physician, or someone who just interacts with the healthcare system when you're sick, I think you'll find this episode interesting and gives you ideas of how you can participate and help out in this sort of process of educating medical students on the things that are not traditionally taught in the curriculum. And as always, the show notes page, which will have links to the things we talk about in the show and opportunities to find other episodes that are referenced, can be found at theparadox.com, that's P-R-A-D-O-C-S, slash 036. When I first started labeling the shows, I put the zero in there in high hopes that at some point I would actually hit triple digits. I don't know that I ever really thought I would, but I certainly feel like I'm en route at this point, cruising along in the mid-30s. I would also like to send a shout out to the two new patrons of the show, Greg Zanakis, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, and Deanna Yen. Thank you so much for your support for the show. As you know, there's a little bonus material available at the Patreon page at patreon.com slash the paradox. I cannot begin to thank you enough for your patronage and thank you for helping to promote and produce the show. The so most effective way to promote the show is what you are all doing right now. You're clearly spreading the show to your friends and colleagues, family members, because as the show grows, it's not through necessarily advertisement as much as it is word of mouth, and you're sending along interesting links and things like that to your friends you think they might find something interesting within our shows and episodes. I really appreciate that, and I will continue doing as much as I can and continue to put out as high-quality material as I possibly can. But without further ado, the discussion with Dr. Beth Haynes of the Benjamin Rush Institute. Enjoy. Welcome, this is Dr. Eric Larson, host of Paradox, and I'm here with my new guest, Beth Haynes. Dr. Haynes is in private practice. She's board certified in family practice, emergency medicine. She's been working full-time in healthcare for the past six years. She attended MD from the University of Cincinnati and did a residency training at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. She is, uh, we're talking to her today because she is the medical director of the Benjamin Rush Institute. She also serves in a, on the executive board member on the Dr. War, War, Joseph Warren Institute, founder and president of the Black Ribbon Project, and she's an executive board member at Docs for Patient Care, so she's not at all busy. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm managed to speak to you in a short window, I think you've got, between visits you've been, as you've been traveling around as you were in the uh, great Midwest, back, back home, I guess, in Wisconsin. Yeah, I went, well, my training was in Madison. I was at Medical College of Wisconsin, and we have a, the Benjamin Rush Institute, which is a, um, an organization that partners with medical students to help them bring in healthcare policy speakers. Well, really, it's uh, speakers on any uh, aspect of medicine that isn't your typical medical curriculum. So um, medical ethics, healthcare policy, um, innovations in healthcare delivery, um, particularly from a free market uh, viewpoint, we help the students bring those kinds of events to their campuses since if they get any of that in their curriculum, it tends to be um, from the point of view that the government is the solution to all of our country's health care challenges. Um, so we think we think we need a broader point of view for the students to be exposed to. And I was 
there last week at Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, um, and we had this second opinion um, series of uh, events where we uh, have people from multiple points of view, and this time it was I was presenting what's going on in the free market alternative delivery um, area currently, and then there was a, a physician that came and spoke advocating for Medicare for all. And then after we each had a time to speak, there was some Q&A afterward. It's just a lot of fun. It's good. Yeah. Well, and those are good discussions to have. And I think those are ones we really don't have much because when you see them in the media, it is it is at most a one-minute soundbite for, for either side, if there is even both sides. And, and generally, are people who don't know what they're talking about, I found. Uh, they're politicians who don't understand the business. <laughs> and so it's really hard for them to make any so coherent point one way or the other. Um, so I, I guess I'd like to get into the Benjamin, Benjamin Rush Institute a little bit. Um, my podcast, I always say the demographics, although I've never officially looked at them, but just from feedback I get, about half physicians and half people who are really not affiliated with healthcare. They might have someone they know who works in the healthcare field, whether it's a spouse or a family member, or just sort of the lay public who are interested in healthcare policy and, and what's going on with physicians and the things we deal with from day to day and delivering care to patients. And so why don't you uh, talk about what inspired the Benjamin Rush? I guess maybe talk about exactly what Benjamin Rush is and then what inspired the creation of Benjamin Rush because it's definitely something that's fairly new. I mean, I, I, at least it only came into my radar a couple of years ago. And what was the, the perceived need for this organization? Well, it really began um, in response to the ramp up um, prior to the Affordable Care Act being passed into legislation. And it was started as a project within the Pacific Research Institute, which is run by Sally Pipes um, out here in California. And she's a Canadian. Um, she has lived in the Canadian single payer system, um, lost her mother pretty much because of delay of, of care um, for her mother, and has just been very motivated um, as an economist to make the case that um, the Canadian system really just is, it just can't function. Um, so she was concerned about the lack of information that was uh, available to medical students and put together the Benjamin Rush Institute um, modeled along the lines of the Federalist Society. So about 35 years ago, there were no, no, professors that were speaking out um, along the lines of reading the plain, interpreting law and the constitution by reading the plain language or through original intent. And a group of students said, we want a broader point of view, so we're gonna start this extracurricular program. And now the Federalist Society is on every single law school um, campus in the country, and several of the current Supreme Court members um, were and still are um, members of the Federalist Society. So using that as a model of a campus-based extracurricular club, um, she started the Benjamin Rush Institute so that we could bring in free enterprise, limited government uh, point of view to the healthcare policy discussions occurring on medical school campuses. And um, we have subsequently, uh, we've been in completely independent, stand on a standalone organization since 2013. Okay. And and I think looking over the list, it looks like, what, how many chapters, 45 or 50 or so? Well, we've had about 40 or 50 through the years. So 40, 40 almost 50 different schools have been involved at various um, points. With the way that the uh, medical school curriculum goes, it's really um, one of our big challenges has been continuity because yeah. the um, classroom period of training is the first two years. After that, students are off on their clinicals and really aren't available to run or hold extra curricular activities very much. So we've just got that two year cycle. And we'll get somebody that's really enthusiastic and excited about it and, and a chapter might last for three or four years and then that person goes away and maybe we don't get it started. So currently, I think we started this year about with about 23 chapters. Um, I know that there's we've got somebody now on board that specifically 
just to build the chapters. And she says she's got another five that are in, um, in the process of getting set up and becoming official. Yeah. And I think, uh, first I'm a faculty member at Michigan state university, although it's, I'm a clinical assistant professor, which means they don't pay me. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which is the best kind of faculty to have if you're a university. Uh, basically I just instruct medical students and residents as they're coming, rotating through the operating rooms or, um, other places. And I interact with them through the medical society. But I, I would say that I don't know what most people think medical school is like, but it's very different than a traditional college of four years where you, because you either have, as you mentioned, two years of didactic or you know, lectures and then two years of clinical rotations where for the most part, is in most schools, certainly Michigan State, you are not at one campus. And so in Michigan State, they send them all over the state. And so they really are dispersed. And so if you don't have a very stable leadership that can last every two years, you can't have an organization. Now, Michigan State has, they have clinicals that begin first year. And, um, and I don't know what that does for, and I know that is a fairly popular trend in medical schools now to start clinical rotations right off the bat uh, and not and just not have just straight didactics. And so I think it, it probably lends to be a little bit more difficult for stability for any sort of organization for the students. Um, and, and I think uh, it's one of the things we talk about in this show a lot is we look at ways, disruptive forces in medicine, innovations, whether that's direct primary care, whether that's discussing what's going on with computerized health records or HIPAA or um, maintenance certification. And so we don't look at the traditional things that people talk about in medicine, or at least we look at it from a different angle, which is why I wanted to have you on because the Benjamin Rush Institute certainly looks, appears to have a different, it appears to, to try and bring in a different point of view because on most campuses is my impression in medical schools is the dominant teaching is not, um, I don't want to say it's nefarious, like there's some sort of agenda, by, but I think just people see the system as it is and they don't see any, they don't see any way of having a different system, right? It's like whatever, however it's done now, we'll do things the same way as far as delivering healthcare, but maybe be just slightly tweaked. And so you're just presenting, I think, just a totally different way of looking at problems. Yeah, well, I think there's a different point of view that academic physicians have about medicine in general, about, and since so many academic places really are, even private um, institutions are heavily dependent upon um, government funding, um, all residency programs, you know, really rely on Medicare funding. It's very difficult, I think, for somebody who has grown up within the university system, becomes an academic uh, professor, to be able to really think and step outside the box. There are some that do that, but I think they're, um, it's a minority. And there's countless studies that have been shown that academia in general tends to be populated in the faculty by people who lean Democrat or lean left. And so they're going to they're going to be very comfortable with the idea of a, a huge role for government in the delivery of healthcare. And so what we want to do is be able to say, well, look, every every treatment you give as a doctor has its effects and has its side effects, and health policy is no different. And if you're not looking at the downsides of that, um, you're doing a, everybody a big disservice. So we not only do we want to show where maybe there's some blind spots as to the problems with um, heavy government involvement in medicine. But we also want to maybe even more importantly present, hey, there's really some cool um, proofs of concept out there in free enterprise that are, are outpacing um, any of the, pro the government programs in terms of providing higher quality and low cost, really bringing the cost down, not just um, artificially giving a lower price on something. Sure. And actually, I was on, interviewed on a podcast last night, and, and I was saying, I was arguing that the it's not the cost of care that's so expensive, it's the price, right? It's like we, we are charging prices which are not reflective of the cost of actually delivering the care. Well, right now, um, there is no functioning price system. If, I mean, people say right. the United States has is proof that the free market doesn't work in medicine. Well, only if you have completely administrative, socialistic kind of prices. There is no functioning price system. 
which means there's not something where there's a supply and demand that is generating the price. Medicare is an administrative pricing system. They just, they have an equation, they plug in these things that they arbitrarily come up with these numbers and bam, you have a, a figure and then most insurance companies will peg off the, the Medicare prices. It's got nothing to do with supply and demand. It's got nothing to do with how efficient or how high quality any of the providers are. Right. And I think, you know, the great example of that is you look at you look at any sort of other business, if you want to try and hire a painter to say to paint your house, they're not all going to come with you, come to you with exactly the same price. I mean, it's totally, it's different based on their skill, their experience, their referrals, their reputation. It all changes, right? And yet in medicine, everything is exactly the same. I mean, it's adjusted by maybe you know, your region if you're in an urban versus a rural area. But essentially, the prices are all completely set <laughs> no matter who you are. Um, so you're all, you are deep within, you're, you're spending a lot of time deep in the, the bowels of medical schools. And you're seeing all these, these fresh medical students because it probably, primarily, I'm guessing, you're seeing mostly first and second years because they're the ones who are, had the time who are around for the during their didactic years what what do you think their attitudes are and what is their response to your your message in the, that of Benjamin Rush you know it's it's an inter- interesting thing and when i can have the kinds of events that i like to have which is showcasing the um the successes that are happening out in the uh, free enterprise system, things like the Surgery Center of Oklahoma with its cash-based pricing, bundled pricing for ambulatory s- surgery, direct primary care, both in, in a for-profit and in a non-profit way, and some really exciting things that are going on over in India with cash-based pricing, with um, Narayana Health which for cardiac surgery, where um, Debbie Shetty's brought the cost of cardiac surgery down to something like 1800 bucks and um, the uh, Aravind eye care system, which is, uh, so Debbie Shetty's a for-profit, um, Aravind eye is a non-profit, but they've got cataract surgeries um, down to something like a hundred dollars and 80% of their patients essentially pay nothing and are completely funded by the paying patients with no government money, not even any donation money that's, that's doing it. It's a fabulous system. So I like to show, share you know, that kind of uh, positive information about how we're bringing down the cost. And then that is received overwhelmingly. People are saying like, wow, how come nobody ever told me this? How can we never hear about these different alternatives? Or the direct primary care. Direct primary care is starting to get a little bit better known, where a couple of years ago, I would say, ask people how many had, had heard of it, and you might get one or two people, and those were mostly the Benjamin Rush, and the rest of the students right. had never heard of it. Um, and now I'm saying probably about a third of the students have heard of that. Um, certainly, no, almost no medical students are aware of the the ability of um, employers to self-fund the health costs and to hire an independent third-party administrator to design their health coverage plan, which is another way of, of really cutting back tremendously, cutting in half a lot of the employer costs for med- medicine. So they get really excited. They're, it's like, wow, we never, we never learned any of this stuff. So I would say that's part of it. I've had some really fun um, interactions where we've taken this healthcare right and, and done it much more Socratic, just say, let's work on this. Let's just look at this. How do, we, and, and those have also, people have come away from that, not necessarily having changed their mind, um, but saying, oh, this, there's a lot more to this um, question and pondering, and there's a lot more thinking that needs to be done. Um, than just saying healthcare is a right and kind of just taking that on its face value. So I think, you know, I think the vast majority of people are, if they don't start questioning their own ideas, they at least say, wow, I never heard of that. Why haven't I heard of that? And I would agree with you in your assessment, it's certainly with the direct primary care, because I remember talking, learning about this maybe four or five years ago when I first heard about it, I guess. I think I was introduced to Lee Gross at a conference. And so I talked to people about this and you talk to medical students and you might as well have three heads, you know, they, but now I found at least in Michigan state, which is, has a, has a, a focus on primary care. 
the kids are coming in and they're 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 fairly they're fairly uh, aware of this this uh this phenomena. We have a number of them in town. Two actually just graduated from residency, and they're they open up their own direct primary care practice. We have almost four practices in town, which is I guess not a lot, but it seems like the the prevalence of the direct primary care is really exploding on the scene. And um and I think the kid I think the I say kids <laughs> they're about twenty four twenty five years old, but uh they're definitely they're definitely very interested in it if not for the concept as much as just the the way the different way of practicing medicine I mean I think that seems to be the greatest appeal to these to these medical students where you mean I can sit down and talk to someone for like thirty minutes and that's okay because they see because they're because they're in the, the the traditional sort the traditional practices when they where you've seen everyone every 10 15 minutes and you're trying to churn through a lot of a lot of volume and so for them i think they just they find that appealing i think they find it less intimidating in some ways just because they they need more time because <laughs> they don't they can't diagnose things as quickly um so for them it, they like that as well yeah you talk to, you talk to the direct primary care doctors and they're the happiest people in medicine oh, I know. these days i know and you know so they sell themselves and they are across the board in the spectrum of, of political points of view, you know, it's, it's, which I love about it, right? You, it's not like you can't have, think that, um, anyway, yes, yeah, that's, that's what I would say. People are across the whole broad spectrum, the docs that are out there doing um, DPC. So it's not right. tied to a, a, a political ideology at all. So it's, it's super inviting. It's, um, you're finding, I'm finding uh, doctors that were just ready to quit are now just loving what they're doing. And that's very contagious. Yeah. No, and and they are the easiest to schedule interviews with, I've too found. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> yep. But yeah, they are, the, they, when I go to Michigan State Medical Society meetings, they are the ones who are the, the happiest and they're they're the most relaxed. And, uh, and, and as you said, they're, from an ideological standpoint, there are probably as many who support, you know, the Democrats versus the Republicans or anything else. And it's not a it's it's not ideological focused way of no, practicing. It's just no. a way of practicing because you're just practicing the way you kind of want to and the way you think is best. And I think that cuts across politics. I would hope. Um, so, what do you what are you going in and talking to these medical students about when it comes to ethics? Because I don't I how is that how is how are you bringing something new into the ethical de- to debate? Well, I think that the example of is healthcare a right is one of those. And the way I do it is like, let's really talk about that. What is a right? What are you basing that on? Um, you know, and then we get into a talk about positive and negative rights. And well, what can you have rights that absolutely contradict each other? And so I, just having those kinds of more in-depth discussions about even just the terminologies that we're using, because I think they're just not well-defined. And if you don't have well-defined terms, um, even if you don't you know, necessarily always agree on it, we I mean, at least need to agree, all right, this is the way we're going to define it right now. You know, you can't think well. You have to have well-defined terms, just like diagnoses. If you have, you know, a, a garbage pail kind of a sense of, of what a particular disease process is like. You just, you, you know, you're not going to diagnose clearly. So right. that's one of them. I mean, I think the other thing is there's all sorts of conflicts that um, people don't, may not be thinking about. Um, that It's been pushed a whole lot about this um, fee-for-service pushes volume, not value. And I like to push back on that because um, we we see fee for service is the main way that we have economic exchanges throughout the world, and if it's um, creating bad incentives in medicine, why is it not creating bad incentives elsewhere? And I actually don't think it does. Fee for service in a very opaque third party payment system does have that problem, but trying to point out that it's the third party payment system. Other areas of ethics is when you sign a contract, now you've got an employer. How are you going to manage it when your employer tells you to practice medicine one way, your brain tells you to practice another way, and um, you know your patients are expecting you to be their primary advocate? And there's, so there's, there's some binds that, that can come up. Not that I think you can't be uh, an employed physician of the highest of integrity, but there are problems, and you better go into into that arrangement with your eyes wide open. Um, so those are some of the things. 
Yeah, an extension that I suppose would be uh, when you're using with private payers, this the same sort of thing when they have metrics and and uh, standards that you have to reach, that you may not necessarily you may be you may be treating populations versus actual patients. And I yeah, I've actually had Dr. Michelle Akata and we discussed that for a while too. But that's certainly an ethical I don't know dilemma, but it's certainly an ethical consideration when you're thinking of you're doing things sometimes. To, to reach reach certain goals that may or may not be advantageous for that particular patient, but it is for the yeah, overall practice. The population health um, being used as a metric to measure your quality and therefore measure your reimbursement is a big problem because then if it's going to hurt you to practice medicine best for the patient in front of you, but you're going to be financially penalized for it, that's a problem. I mean, another one is too, it's like if, if whether whether you're in the Medicare system or whether you're in a private insurance, there will be places where the Medicare or private insurance will say we don't cover X unless Y condition exists. How much do you stretch the truth there to help your patient be have that covered? You know, so there's yeah. a there's a lot of stuff with it. When when you have that third party, there's a whole set of ethical dilemmas that don't come up when you're um, dealing much more directly with a patient. Right. And, and I think it's important to, to note too, that just because there's a third party payer system, uh, doesn't necessarily mean that if it's just a transaction between two, just the patient, and the physician, that it's always ethical either. I mean, I, right. oh, no. there, are, there are dishonest people everywhere. And I think sometimes people get the impression, well, I know all kinds of crooks, right. And, and so why does your system so much better? And I will say, well, it's not the system <laughs> per se, uh, you have you have unethical people all over the place, and that's there's no shortage of that. But obviously, you can you have a system that encourages people to be more ethical. I think in, when you don't have, and at least has your should have your vested interests um, at the at the top of the priority versus maybe someone. Well, else. see, and that's why I think a fee for service where my where the patients are paying me directly for the, for my service actually the better I serve them medically and economically, the better I'm going to do. So it's in my best interest to actually take the, the whole patient, including their economics into consideration in my consultation with them. And then we decide together what the, you know, what fits their values and their, their capabilities as to match how we're going to do a treatment plan. Right. It's like the auto mechanic, right? They can, they can take your car apart, change all kinds of parts and charge you a lot for labor. And uh, you have a, you do that a couple of times. You get a reputation of someone right. who's not trustworthy, right? And so then right. people are, that gets out pretty quickly. And the ones who are doing it the right way and who are, you know, everyone knows the good mechanics and bad mechanics in town after you've been there for a while, right? Or you ask around and you find the ones you're good. And I imagine that the same sort of system would work within uh, with medicine. I mean, I know it does because that's <laughs> they get, people get referrals. And it worked that way for years and years, you know. And for the longest time, it used to be that um, you'd pay the doctor, you'd pay the hospital. And then it would be up to the patient to take the bills and get reimbursed from the insurance company. And then, so then, you know, there's just that transparency is greater when the patient is in charge of the dollars, even if they don't, aren't the ultimate one that ends up paying. As, a, as someone from Benjamin Rush, what would you recommend a medical student, if there was a, a dean of medical school listening to this, what would you recommend that they add to their curriculum um, to better equip their, their future physicians with understanding the healthcare system, maybe preparing themselves for the career outside of um, the once they actually get out of re residency. So I, yeah, I've got this um, healthcare 101 curriculum that's I, I've written up as an outline um, periodically. And it's just, you know, different priorities, uh, different fires have to get put out before I ever really get to it. But it would be things like really having a course that explains what is Medicare? How does that work? What is Medicaid? How does it work? What is the ACA? How does that work? but also giving sufficient time to what is um, private medicine and what are the, the healthcare um, delivery innovations that are going on and um, how to, what is and isn't insurance. I mean, I think that's, there's even listening to, to comments that our Supreme Court justices make 
people do not understand what insurance is or not. We call um, Medicare and Medicaid, which are really wealth distribution, redistribution programs, which may be what we want to do as a country, fine, but it doesn't help us to call them insurance because they're not. And, and same thing with, you know, um, the way we have, the law now um, prescribes that healthcare coverage include all these predictable small um, costs. They're, they're, you can't, it's not risk. They're, they're not a, something that might possibly happen in the future. You know you're going to need them. And that's not the way insurance works. Insurance is for unpredictable, large, catastrophic um, events that are not under the control of the insured. That's what insurance is. That's where we can figure out what risk is and how, um, you know, what your, what, do the actuarial tables on that. But until we really understand what is and isn't insurance, and again, getting those terms correctly, you can't think clearly any more clearly than the, the clarity of your terms. And we have really muddied the system because of, you know, it sounds good. Right. And I, and I think it probably to some extent that it's intentional. I think the the terms have been used synonymously either by, I think mostly intentional, but I think some people are just, uh, just not aware of exactly the differences. It's sort of like treating rheumatism, right? It doesn't really, that just, term doesn't exist anymore <laughs> because... <laughs> Right, right. Because it, it covers too many things. Yes. I mean, it could be osteoarthritis. It could be rheumatic arthritis. It could be juvenile. I mean, there's all there. You know, gout. It could be anything. Right. And so, and so, it's important to have the right terminology because if you can't, there's no way you can come to an actual solution unless you have precise terminology, which is what we try and do in medicine, right? Like if you try and tell someone where to cut next, uh, the surgeon's talking to the resident. They say, you know, go a little more lateral, more anterior, whatever. They don't just say, you know, go to the left or the right because well, what, what are they tend? Are they facing the opposite direction? Is their left, my right, right? So, right. so you have to be very stage left, you have to be stage very, right. Right. You have to be very <laughs> intentional about how you talk about things for that very reason because it's it's a pretty complicated thing we're doing, and you and you, you want to try and avoid errors in thinking and, and actions. Uh, do you think a financial part of should be aspect should be added to the curriculum of medical schools as well? With, well, I mean, it, well, I would, dealing with I would debt lo- and- yeah, I would love to see at least an elective for students to be able to take in their fourth year about um, the business of medicine. I mean, I, and I get that right now, the way the um, amount of debt that students are coming out of school with makes the idea of going into private practice right out of um, residency really seem daunting. But I would say the majority of people, I, I, I think everybody from my um, residency was planning to go and open up their own office. Now it's like everybody's expecting to either be a hospitalist or an employed physician in a large group or, you know, somewhere along that. And, the, and, and it's completely intimidating, the idea of actually having your own practice. And without... Um, students being exposed to doctors coming in and saying, hey, you can still do this, and this is what it's like, and these are the things. At the very least, having something like, here's how to read an employment contract to make sure that you're not signing up for some kind of commitment that you can't get out of for 10 years should you change Mm -hmm. your mind. Um, So yes, something more about the mechanics of how to run a practice, how to interpret um, contracts, uh, those kinds of things, I think, at the very least, being an elective would be a fabulous addition. Yeah, and I think the the problem with not having uh, enough mentors in the in the private field is just you, you don't have the mentors, and so you don't you don't you have no no one to sort of emulate or to get bounce ideas off of how you actually run successfully in the private sphere. And then, frankly, like you said, it's even even if you're going to go to an employed option, you know, how do you prevent getting into a situation where you don't have uh, you know, it's loan forgiveness, but you have to work for 10 years and there's uh, no compete. And so if you want to move into town, you can't practice ever again. You can't go to the hospital system across town. You, you have to actually leave town and sell your house. Oh, maybe you shouldn't be owning a house. I mean, all those sorts of considerations that I think when you, when you get to that first paycheck, you think, oh, I'm rich. And then you forget how much debt you have and <laughs> all, yeah. This, yeah. all those other things because you got to take care of your family or, you know, at least yourself. Do you, do you focus a lot of your time on expanding the, the students 
the student chapters and and how do students get involved to start these things? So um, right now, for the longest time, we, it was there was just too much. We didn't have enough staff to really do very much outreach other than you know, talking to the students that got interested and saying, hey, anybody in your undergrad, you know, that you were pre-meds with, they might know, you know, and just doing some word of mouth. Most of our students just stumbled onto us. We get fed up with a with a very one-sided uh, presentation of healthcare policy, and they'd Google free market uh, medical school groups, and we would come up. Um, so that... Right now, we do have somebody who is working to proactively go out and um, contact the schools and make sure that Benton Rush is known about. But if somebody wants is, is interested in starting a chapter, or if we if there's physicians out there that are interested in uh, supporting us, because that's that can that's been a challenge. I've had some students that were interested and then were never able to get a chapter going because they couldn't get a faculty person who was willing to sponsor them, which I think is tragic. Yeah. Um, so if they're interested at all, you can go to the uh, Benjamin Rush Institute website, benjaminrushinstitute.org, and um, follow the links. There should be pretty clear on how to, if you how to indicate that you're interested in the chapter or if you're interested in supporting it in other ways. And then somebody will get back to you. And then once the, once the group is formed, you, obviously you're going to talks and having debates and things. Are those things you set up uh, from your headquarters or do you, or do you have the students have to arrange those? Yeah, we, we do ask that the students go through their school and become an official organization because then that allows them to use the um, campus facilities to be able to hold events but we um, support them with some funding to like do things like pay for lunch for the lunch talks. Um, if they need to or are interested in having a larger event that requires um, some assistance bringing a speaker in from a distance, then we also have some funding available for that. Um, they would apply to us, say, hey, I want to do this event. Here's my budget for the event. You know, is that something that that fits with our larger. Um, and then it, it's variable from school to school how much funding they get from the school themselves. But I would say the vast majority of our, our clubs um, rely on the National Benjamin Rush Institute to help, help with the funding for foods, equipment, things like that. The other uh, benefit that the students have is we have a scholarship program um, for, that they can apply, members can apply to to get a scholarship to go to various healthcare policy um, conferences. So we've had students go to conferences at Harvard, at Yale, direct primary care conferences, um, the Free Market Medical Association conferences. Um, uh, there was a, there's a Western United States medical conference that was held in Southern California a couple years ago, um, American Academy of private practice, which no longer gives conferences, we sent them to that. So if they know of a health policy um, conference that they want to go to, and we don't advertise it as a, as a current scholarship, they can say, hey, what do you think? Can I go to that? Is there money for that? So that's another benefit of belonging so that we can get people a broader spectrum of exposure to various ideas in, in health policy. And I've been actually a fairly frequent listener of the Next Gen Med, which Yay! is the podcast. Yeah, right. It actually gives me some great ideas for shows as well and, and guests. Um, and uh, it, I want to say I listened to one episode, and they were, I think they were talking about internships in D.C. Is that something that's available too? Or so at, um, there are several think tanks, free market based oh, think, okay, think tanks right. that have um, internships, and we work with the students to help them be able to get that. There was one year I had um, a student do an internship with BRI for a full year. He was the one that started the Next Gen Med um, podcast. And um, we've had a couple of summer interns through um, BRI. Um, one, one student, uh, Danny Milyovsky from Stony Brook, um, I worked with him and we created a pamphlet explaining why, why in the rest of the world and industries when you digitalize and upgrade into computers, things get more efficient. But in medicine, the EHRs made things worse. And he yeah. gave the whole history and analysis of, of that through the, the high-tech laws and um, 
just why that's such a mess. Um, so we do have some internships um, from time to time if there's a student that's interested. And you obviously spend quite a bit of time advocating for these policies. You do find time for practice too. Is it, are you, is it a part-time practice at this point or how do so you, I've, how's I've been, your medicine? Yeah, for? I've been full-time doing um, the healthcare policy since 2009 up, okay. and, up until um, just this January. And I've got, I've been backing off some of the and commitment to BRI. I'm very fascinated by functional medicine and I'm actually back in school <laughs> <What>? <laughs> taking functional medicine because 80% of our healthcare dollars are on chronic illnesses, and yet we're continuing to try and treat them in an acute care model. And I think that if I, you know, my goal is to get affordable healthcare for, affordable quality healthcare for everybody, and ideally give, the, you know, help them figure out a way to empower themselves um, and not have to rely on, on the medical system. And I think functional medicine has a really fascinating um, possibility, and I want to learn more about it. And I'll probably, um, I've been working just with um, family members, uh, a couple of patients and friends with cancer that I've been working with them from a functional standpoint. I don't take care of their cancer, but I try and help um, maximize the rest of their, their life and lifestyle, nutrition, diet, exercise, stress management, community. Um, and then I, I hopefully will be able to put together a small consulting practice in the next year or so. Okay. And then what do you, what is your role on the docs for patient care? So I'm on the board. I started, that's how I got started in the whole health policy thing. So the first couple of years I was a volunteer um, health policy analyst with them. And then um, things have morphed and now I'm on the board. So I got just, sucked in. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a great group of guys. I'm also actually on the board of the Galen Institute, which is another think, uh, free market think tank based in Washington, D.C. So do you spend a lot of time traveling then? I did um, up until about six months ago. I have a 97-year-old mother-in-law that I'm the primary emotional support for, and I'm going to hang close to home until she's not around anymore. Understood. Okay. Well, is there something that you would recommend for the physicians listening for how to either get involved or to help out with this process? Because I think, I always hate saying the term, the children are our future, but the, but medical students are obviously future physicians. And so it's important for them to understand whatever the decisions are as far as career choices and how they want to practice medicine, but that they have all the options and they understand the world better than they do now. Yeah, you, you can go on to the, um, the BRI website, BenjaminRussianInstitute.org, and we have a list of all the chapters there. If you're close by, um, there should be contact information for the student leaders there. And if not, you can always um, just do info at BenjaminRussianInstitute.org and email us and let us know that you would like to help and in what capacity you would like to help. Um, we do screen our speakers because we want people to be knowledgeable and really have the, the informative but collaborative um, attitude to, to bring to the students. Um, we're not a political advocacy group. We're an educational group. Um, but we're always looking for, for people who are good speakers and have some interesting um, new information to share with the students. And like I said, mentors. Um, interested in mentors, faculty members who are willing um, to work with us. So yeah, those are the ways that the doctors could. And the other thing if they wanted to um, is to put together a blog and we could put it up on the, um, the BR, potentially put it up. I'm not going to promise anything, but you know, <laughs> if it fits within our mission and scope, um, we could have the, the docs out in the trenches talking about what they're seeing the problems of, and ideally emphasizing some of the solutions that they're putting into practice. Very neat. And, and where do you find the speakers that you, um, I don't want to say debate, but where you, where you have discussions on say the, for instance, the Medicare for all, I mean, someone who comes in, advocates yeah, we, is that another physician I, it's, or is it? It's great. We have a great working relationship with the physicians for a national health plan. And then the student organization is snap. 
and I think it's students for a national health plan or something like that. And um, we've been approached by them. And then when we want to put something on, we can approach them and they love being able to come talk as well. So we work really hand in hand with them quite a bit. Do you, do you find that they seek you out for their events that they plan? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah. We've had several um, debates at Einstein um, that they sought us out. Um, i trying to think where else. So that's the first one that comes to mind, but um, definitely they're interested in, in partic- participating with us. Any other things uh, that we should talk about as far as personal projects of yours or places for people to find what you're doing? Oh, yeah, what I'm is that too to. too numerous to list? <laughs> yeah, no, no. I think yeah, my my one of my other than functional medicine, my my new passion, and I I haven't done anything that's visible about it yet, but I I really think there we cannot emphasize enough the need to do what I call as upgrade the conversation. So there's a number of things that I've been reading or listening to, which I think really help focuses on those thinking skills, things like define your terms, limit the amount that you're going to talk about at any one point so that you can really get into depth, sort of how to have those constructive conversations that actually move things forward. So I read um, Coddling of the American Mind by Jonathan Haidt, and I can't remember the other author, and they talk about some of the cognitive distortions that are, are really prevalent on college campuses these days that you analyze through cognitive behavioral therapy. And then Hans Rosling, who's a physician, a, was a phys- uh, Scandinavian physician involved in world health, just wrote a book called Factfulness. And he also looks at, here's some of the errors in thinking that are um, getting in the way of us really solving the problems, look, identifying real problems, not just things that we emotionally think are problems. And so factfulness is a good one. Um, the Arthur Brooks show has a series of podcasts about how to have civil, di- how to move the political discourse in our country forward. And then Alex Epstein of the um, Center for Industrial Progress also has a podcast called Human Flourishing Project. And his whole goal there is what are the systems of knowledge acquisition and knowledge dissemination and knowledge evaluation that we need to have in place, again, to really um, be, have critical thinking uh, to make have human flourishing. So those are some of the sources that I have been really um, delving into and muddling around with how to then pre, being able to present those to students is how do we think better about this? And one of them is you need people from a wide variety of viewpoints because of the intense um, tendency that everybody has, myself absolutely included, of towards confirmation bias. Yes. Yeah. I, I suffer from that just like anyone else. And so I found one of the, the nice thing about doing this podcast is that I've, I've had people reach out to me who I wouldn't ordinarily speak to, <laughs> and certainly in disciplines that are not, not ones that I interact with. And it, it, it helps to see things from other, from other viewpoints. And, uh, it's it, so it important your sharp- not to be wedded yeah. to a specific viewpoint, but just to a true understanding and if somebody can show me where I'm wrong, I really want to make sure my mind is open to that. Um, and we're only going to do that through conversation with people who disagree with us. Yes, if only they could learn how to do that in television. But then maybe none of us would tune in and watch. I guess suppose that's the. <laughs> I certainly the don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'll have make sure I have up the contact information for the Benjamin Rush Institute at theparadox.com/slash year thirty six as well as show notes for the number of the books you mentioned, the shows, and then I suppose your Twitter so people could follow you on Twitter. I, though I don't think you'd tweet a whole lot, but. Um, yeah, not so much tweeting. I do. We do have a Facebook page and I, um, when I get it, there's an interesting article I posted up on the Facebook page. There's usually a couple of those a week and I try to just get the best of the best. So, and, and keep them pretty even, you know, here's, here's the bad news about policy. Here's the good news about the, exciting stuff that's going on in medicine. Let's keep it going. Right. Yeah. You can spend a lot of time on social media and, and not, not get much done. So that's a, it's a huge time suck. Well, they, thanks again so much for, for coming on with me today. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks for your interest in the Benjamin Rush Institute. My pleasure.
Thanks for listening to The Paradox. If you like what The Doc is doing, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher. And share the show with your friends. Become a supporting listener to get access to special bonuses at patreon.com forward slash theparadox. Show notes can be found at theparadox.com. <laughs>